Alrighty you guys, welcome back to another little video where today we're going to be taking a look at a very fun little GPU. The GTX 760 OEM. Let's get into it. Okay, let me just first off by saying thank you very much for watching, thank you very much for coming by, subscribing, all that fun stuff. Let's get into it, shall we? Okay, so today, I wanted to take a look at the GTX 760, but not just any GTX 760, the OEM variation of the GTX 760, which actually is kind of an interesting card in and of itself. Um, the whole idea originally was that I was going to test out the GTX 760 uh, primarily because it is um, a very obtainable card. It is a realistically obtainable card in 2021. Um, the cards can be typically found for about 110 to 125-ish, which might seem like a lot for a GTX 760, but being the fact that right now you really can't find any graphics cards for a reasonable price, the GTX 760 has actually become a viable and honestly quite meta option when it comes to building these computers. But. In my research of the GTX 760 OEM, I discovered something very kind of cool, which led me down a little bit of an interesting path. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. This is the website, or this is NVIDIA's main website, and this is their specifications of the GTX 760 OEM card. It has 1152 CUDA cores, with a base clock of 823 and a boost clock of 888. Uh, it has 1.5 gigabytes of VRAM. It has all of the modern instruction sets that you would expect from Kepler. It also only requires a single 6-pin connector with a uh, maximum TDP, or a graphics card's uh, maximum power output, of 130 watts. Which is, um, I want to say about... What is that, 40 under? Because I think the original card was 170 watt. This is a 130 watt as a maximum. Meaning that this card is actually pretty darn efficient and pretty darn power effective. And I will go over that a little bit later. But I discovered something kind of interesting. The GTX 760 OEM is the exact same card as the GTX 660 OEM. This whole sheet's gonna look very familiar. But it is the GTX 660 OEM instead of 760. CUDA cores 1152, base clock 823, boost clock 888. Same TDP, same everything. So what that means is that this GTX 760 is actually a Kepler, first generation Kepler base card that's actually really efficient. Even the uh, 660 OEM card has the same TDP and well, same everything. So that's kind of the cool thing. Um, but that was just kind of one of the things that I discovered when actually going through this. So, how do I word this? So, essentially, what this kind of leads me on is that cards like the GTX 760 and the GTX 660 are actually pretty darn decent options, and especially for their price. We hop over to eBay here, and you can see something like this. This is another Dell OEM card for less than $90. We've got uh, bidding going on right now, and they're probably going to be selling for around $100. Here is a buy it now for a 660 super clocked, which is actually the faster variation of the 660, being the OEM is actually the slowest, but we'll get into performance here in a little bit. So as you can see here, you can very comfortably and very easily find both 660s and 760s. If we pop over to 760s, they are slightly more expensive, but only slightly. As you can see here, uh, this one, that's overpriced. Um, here's another Dell um, 760 OEM card, yet again for right about that $100 price point. This is an interesting one right here. This is an OEM TI card, which has a... I believe it is the uh, GTX... 670 straight like a gtx 670 just with a 760 cooler on it um but yeah as you guys can see here these things are all selling for right about that 100 dollars price point and i know that people will 
look at these cards and think this is not exactly a great graphics card, especially for the price. But you've got to remember that right now, prices of graphics cards have absolutely skyrocketing and gone completely insane. So being able to pick up a decent graphics card that you can use to play most games, no, not all games, but most games at relatively decent frame rates is something that's actually pretty darn good right now. Okay, so the specs of our test bench are as follows. The i7-2600, 16GB of RAM running at 1333 and dual channel. Um, all running out of a Dell Optiplex 990 with a Samsung 860 Pro 1TB boot drive. Okay, but now that we've gotten the price and the kind of reason to take a look at this graphics card, let's actually look at some of its benchmarks. So. To actually go first onto the power consumption of this card, let's get the boring stuff out of the way first. Let's talk about power consumption. This card has a 130 watt TDP, meaning that it will not exceed 130 watts. When I did all of my testing um, using MSI Afterburner to record all of the power data, the graphics card never went over 95 watts power consumption, meaning the fact that it was pulling 75 watts from the uh, PCB and only around like 25 to 35 watts from the actual six pin power connector meaning that you could run this graphics card off of a relatively weak gra uh, relatively weak power supply and probably not have many issues granted i'd never recommend buying a cheap power supply but something like an actual decent oem power supply this graphics card could probably be handled by pretty easily okay it has 1.5 gigabytes of vram and the core of the GPU, as NVIDIA reports it, it's only going to boost up to 888, but as long as you have thermal headroom, it'll boost all the way up to almost a gigahertz. Um, for all of my testing, my card pretty much stayed around that 953 um, core clock, and the memory was at 1398, sitting at that uh, under full load. So to go through the Fire Strike and Skydiver benchmarks real quick, for Fire Strike normal, we got 4484. For Skydiver, we got um, 13,812, which aren't super, super high numbers, um, but yet again, that's just kind of to give you a synthetic general idea of what you'd be getting yourself into. Okay, first game, and probably the game most people are interested in, Rainbow Six Siege. I did it on both Vulcan and DirectX 11. So for Vulcan, I got an average of 113 FPS at 900p low. When switching over to DirectX 11, I got an average FPS of 138 on 900p low. Which is actually pretty darn impressive for a card with only 1.5 gigs of VRAM. The cores on these things are not slow by any means, so... I would say that at 900p low settings, it's actually a pretty darn playable experience. Maybe not as competitive as what some people might like, but that is not a bad... That is not a bad showing. Another game that this card is perfectly suited for is Grim Dawn. Now, Grim Dawn at 900p uh, medium settings across the board netted us an extremely smooth and average 60 FPS. Now, yes, that was V-Synced, but like I said, that's the way you're supposed to play that game. Now let's get into some games that you might not be expecting me to say here. Borderlands 3. At 900p, very low settings, we averaged 55 FPS. Yeah. Borderlands 3 was averaging 55 FPS on the very low settings at 900p. When I dropped the resolution down to 1440 by 900p, which is um, a step between 720p and 900p, at very low settings, we averaged 78 FPS. Now, it wasn't the smoothest experience in the world, but it was actually pretty playable. Okay, so I played Borderlands 3 from the point where I had left off in the last video. Um, so that was like right where I was meeting Hammerlock. Um, and then I played all the way to the point where you fight Troy. So it wasn't a super long ways that I played, but it was in one of the most demanding areas, and I still averaged about 78-ish FPS. It was very playable, like very, very playable for what I was considering, especially out of a $100 graphics card. 
Alright, the next game. This is a little bit of an older AAA title, but still a AAA title. The Division 1. At 900p low settings, we averaged 73 FPS. Very playable, very fun experience. Destiny 2. Um, at 900p and the lowest settings, we were averaging between 60 FPS and about 75 FPS. Uh, getting an average FPS on that game is kind of hard because of the way that the system works and MSI never wants to work with it, so... Yeah, that's kind of a more of a ballpark estimate, but still pretty darn good. Okay, Fallout 4. At 900p, medium settings, we were locked at 60 FPS. With no anti-aliasing and none of the, uh, I think it's and the something filtering. I forget exactly what it's called. I'll put it on screen. Um, we averaged, or we were, like, pinned at 60 FPS. If you try increasing the settings up to high, you hit the VRAM limit and you drop down to about 20 FPS. So as long as you're not hitting that VRAM limit, you're in a pretty good spot. Fortnite, uh, a game that I downloaded specifically to test this GPU. We were sitting at an average of 100 FPS pro settings, so epic view distance, everything else set to low, and we averaged over 100 FPS. Apex Legends, um, what was it, 900p lowest, we were sitting between 68 FPS and 80 FPS in the um, target range. I don't know how that translates into normal gameplay, I did not play a normal game with it, but it did seem to be pretty darn playable. And especially being that it was closer to that 80 FPS than that 60 FPS, so I'm assuming it would work pretty well. Dota 2, at pro settings, meaning um, high textures and then all the other fancy stuff turned off and then like low effect and low shadows, um, I was pegged at 120 FPS, which is the frame limit that I keep on the game, and it was pegged at 120 FPS. If I were to increase the frame limit, it probably would have gone to like 150, 160. But yet again, a perfect example of a game that this card is just designed to use or designed to run. Uh, CS:GO and Valorant both ran fantastically, and I shouldn't have to tell you guys that those games are relatively easy to run. This graphics card destroyed them. And now, finally, the one game that did not run very well on this system. COD Warzone. This one kind of makes me sad because I was really hoping to be able to play Call of Duty Warzone on this thing, but it wasn't the most playable. At 720p lowest settings, we were sitting at an average of 35 FPS. Now, it was a relatively smooth 35 FPS, but for a game like Call of Duty Warzone, you really want to have as many frames as possible, and I'm sorry, but 720p lowest settings with that kind of FPS just did not, did not exactly work as well as what I would have wanted it to. So with that being said, it is what it is. And, okay guys, now just in conclusion, what do I think about the GTX 760, especially the GTX 760 OEM card? This thing is the slowest and the weakest 760. In fact, this thing might as well be a 660. But this card is pretty darn good. For the money that you would spend to buy a card like this, there are so many games that you could play. Now granted, I didn't test all the newest, latest AAA title games, but that's not what this thing is designed for. The fact of the matter is, with only 1.5GB of VRAM, you're not going to be playing at super high resolutions, and you're not going to be playing at super high settings. But playing esports games like Overwatch, Dota 2, League of Legends, CSGO, Valorant, Rocket League, um, what are some other ones? Paladins, uh, Fortnite, obviously. You can play these games and have a super good time doing it. So yes, is this graphics card absolutely perfect? No. But could you have a really fun time with something like this? Absolutely. And do I recommend it? Well, for the price, I would say I do. Primarily because it's realistically achievable and real realistically obtainable in 2021. Now, I would not spend probably over $120 on a 760. That's just what it comes down to. But as it sits right now, I definitely would spend the $100 to buy one, and in fact, I very well might get another one to try and do some fun SLI shenanigans, because these are pretty darn good graphics cards. So with that being said, 
thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you guys later. Peace.